second here. All right, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to Great Mind Session 6. My name is Darren Adair with American Hospitality Consulting. I appreciate you all being here this evening. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded uh, June 1st, 2021. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to run through uh, a couple of quick things as we get started here. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen, but I will not be leaving it up through the entire meeting because I know that can get a little annoying. Um, so um, Great Mind Session 6. Again, welcome to uh, all who are here. Uh, these sessions are for all of us. They are for us to share, uh, give our feedback, give our ideas. We're all hospitality professionals and we're getting together as a hospitality community to help each other out. You know, if you choose to use some of these ideas, you know what's best for your business. Uh, you make the right decisions for, uh, for your business and do so at your own free will. Um, we're going to be talking about um, steps to reopening and getting ready to reopen. So this is a positive call. We've talked a lot about the challenges. We've talked a lot about, you know, how are we going to survive through? We're actually starting to move in a positive direction. Um, so I've, I've, I've put together a list and I've got joining me tonight. Who's going to, who's going to join us on the panel and help us out is uh, David Martin. And uh, David is a past professor at Ryerson university. One of my old Profs, my alma mater. So, and uh, he is the owner and founder of Simmer Simulation. So, David, thank you very much for uh, joining us this You're evening and, and being a part of the panel. And uh, we're looking forward to it. So, guys, I know we're not going to get through this entire list tonight. I just wanted to put it up here. The list I will make available. I'll share my uh, email at the end if you want a copy. I'd be more than happy to share it out with you. But the last two calls, we've talked a lot about recruitment and using training as a tool for recruitment and focusing very heavily on that hiring piece because it's important and we need to get that done. But there's things you need to figure out before you get to that point. You need to figure out some other key components so you know how many people do you hire? What do you need to run your business? Are you gonna be able to open fully? So, you know, I've put together this quick list um, that I wanted to quickly run through and then I'll, I'll take it off the screen and we're, we're just going to focus on a couple of key components and David's going to kind of give some of his uh, insight and thoughts on this. But, you know, before you can really start going forward, you need to figure out where you are right now. You've got to do that assessment of the current state, right? Where are you in your business right now? You can't forget to take a look at where were you before this? You know, what, was, what did things look like? Where are you now? <laughs> And then take a look at some of the market trends that are out there. And by that, we're already seeing some markets that are starting to open. So with those markets, can you get any data? Can, do you have people in that area? Is there stuff that I can help you with to determine what are those areas seeing? Use that information to help you determine what steps you're going to use to move forward. Take a look at what innovations you brought in during COVID. Are you going to keep any of those? Reviewing all that type of stuff, you know, looking at the changes to your menu, any tech, that kind of thing. Developing a target plan off of all of that. The next two, six and seven, hiring and training. It, there is some argument to actually have the training piece ahead of hiring, determining what is your training plan going to be? How long is it going to be? Who's going to be doing that? What extent are you going to need to do? How many new items have you put in there? Uh, going into an advertising plan and then monitoring and moving on to, uh, you know, next steps to reassess and adjust where necessary. So I really am going to focus on a couple of these myself tonight, um, assessment of current state and then uh, determining what innovation and changes, because I'd like to hear from a lot of you, what are some of the things that you've decided to keep from the introductions you've made during uh, COVID. So, but before I get into that, I'm going to bring David on. Uh, David and I have had a few conversations about this and he had some great thoughts and some of the things that you know, with David's been uh, in this industry a long time. He has helped educate a lot of people on, uh, on working in this industry and the benefits of this industry and how to be a professional in this industry. Um, I, you know, he's, like I said, he was one of my professors when I went to the school. We always had a lot of respect for his opinion and um, I'm just very happy to have him here this evening. So David, um, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Thank you very much, Darren. Hey, no, uh, this hey, I don't want to just, sorry, David, interrupt, but could we just maybe have people who aren't speaking put their, uh, on some uh, things on mute. Because Thank you very much. Yeah, I was actually just going to go. 
I was just going to go through and do that, David. And guys, if as people are speaking, if you do have questions, just send a little note in the chat box that you wanted to uh, share a thought or ask a question, and I'll uh, I'll call you in once uh, we have a free moment. Um, but that way, it just keeps it so we can uh, you know uh, hear everybody and keep things moving. So, all right, Greg, thank you for doing that. Uh, David, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, the sessions have been great, Darren. Um, in terms of talking about where we are, what's happening to our industry, in terms of our concerns about um, everything from professionalism to not being able to open to losing staff, where are we gonna recruit these people from? And in our discussions just recently talking about, are we ready to reopen and come back? I think we've got a great long list of things that we, yeah, that's a great checklist and we need to go through all of that. But I kept thinking about what we were going to talk about tonight. And my whole background <clears throat> getting into academia has become service quality management from way back when. And really talking about what is that? And that's all about dealing with, you want to call it for all intents and purposes, two customers. The customers that pay you coming through the door and the customers are serving those people who you've hired to service those people. Both of those groups have big expectations. I haven't been to a restaurant in two years. I think I've taken done takeout once. Um, I think we're all a little bit nervous about the process. But upon reopening, I'm saying, what is it that I want? And I have my expectations of the, my favorite restaurant and that was my last experience. And over that period of time, I've made those expectations higher and higher and higher. Say, this is exactly what I want. And I think in addressing as a, as a group tonight and, and as operators, we need to be prepared for that one pent up demand, but that very high level of expectation. And so the customer is wanting it to be exactly the same the way it was. Now, you might have introduced new things along the way, and I think you need to take stock of that and, and how they reacted to that. But I think for most of us, and I'm talking mainly you know, dining in, um, quick service has been open, but not their full unit but dining in uh, places where people are actually seated at a table, we have some very high expectations and we want it to be the same way. So I think in terms of doing that checklist, are we ready to go? Are we ready to do it the same way? And uh, have we got our facility you know, up to snuff? Uh, uh, is it ready to go? Is it clean? Is it tidy? Ready to execute that? Um, the other side is, I think our big challenge will be is to meet the expectations of the uh, employees, whether they have been with you in the past or they're new people coming in. It can't be a job anymore. It is a career and we have to be able to make sure these people feel very comfortable that we're opening for real this time and that there is you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And we have to make sure that their expectations are being met so that they can actually do the job that uh, we have uh, got ahead of us to de deliver to the customer who's got these great expectations. And I, and I say that because you know, dealing with the customer, our level of satisfaction is one of emotion and we're satisfied or we're not. And the better the service, the better that we can rationalize that, the better we feel inside. And so we have sat there and like I said, this has been stewing for probably two, two almost two years of coming up to be able to get back into a restaurant and go out and enjoy ourselves and socialize with our friends. So that to me is, is a key component. We talked there and I, I also concerned about a lot of these places getting ready to open and I'm seeing signs saying we're opening in new weeks or we're open now. And that I think sometimes operators, because we all know that a lot of operators need more education on the on the metrics of our business <clears throat> are too anxious to give it away. In other words, you know, let's do a promotion. Let's try to bring people in. People are gonna come anyways. And people are not expecting any kind of deal. They just want great service and they're gonna be willing to pay you for that great service. So you've got to deliver the first time out. And so that's, that's a big issue that I have around the whole thing is are we ready to meet those customers needs? And I think a lot of us have an operation already that we have been successful. So we just need to put that polish on and open the door. 
I think there's room for us to tell everybody here's the boxes you should go through for the metrics. But I think that, you know, focusing on the two people, the two groups of folks, the employee and the customer on their needs is really going to pay dividends for us as we reopen. And the other comment that I want to throw out there is that, you know, we talk about offering specials, those kinds of things. We're not, none of us are going to make a profit this year. We're going to be paying off that debt load that we've tried to, you know, hang on to our restaurants. We've had to be funneling money after it. So we need to be looking at our menu. We need to be telling our, our folks to say, sell the sizzle, sell that steak rather than the chicken wings. We need to have that bigger contribution to margin to the bottom line. So we need to kind of focus on that aspect to say, let's get that cash flow moving so that we can survive another day. Um, so those are some of my comments, and I'm looking forward to giving feedback from folks. But uh, I think it's it's an interesting thing that we haven't talked enough about what the customer wants and what is it the employee wants. And that's that's definitely some uh, some very key points here, David. Thank you for that. And you know, uh, some of the stuff I have on here is doing that bit of a culture assessment to see where are you right now, so you can address that piece. But also, you know all those old staff, those trained staff, are they available to come back to you? I mean, there's some key things that you need to have in there. Trina, you sent in a question. If you want to unmute yourself and just ask that question uh, to David or to anybody who wants to give some feedback on there, we'd appreciate it. But go ahead and ask your question, Trina. Sure. And I'm, and I'm just reflecting being that customer going in and some of the conversations when Ontario was open the last time I got to go to the pub restaurant, conversations I was having with my waiter. So you had mentioned when staff come back and they're feeling comfortable. What does comfortable look like to them? What does comfortable look like to the employer? How does the employer um, produce that environment of comfortable? Does comfortable mean safe? How does psychologically safe in the workplace, in the restaurant look? How will the employer or the employee server translate the questions asked by the customer? Is it safe, psychologically safe, physically safe? How have you dealt with it? Because these questions, as a customer, you will have these casual conversations because that is the, the conversation. So how, as an employer, are you going to create and instill that psychologically safe workplace with the topic of COVID, right? And it is now part of the Occupational Health and Safety Codes in regards right. to psychological safety. So how does comfortable translate to safe to translate to the communication of the employee from the employer, but then from the employee to the client, to the the patrons? Great, great question. Trina. I mean, I think that, you know, just taking those things that you mentioned, we need to be able to make sure that we have the right messaging, um, certainly from the health point of view with the government saying that we can message that information to um, our customers and make sure that um, our employees are comfortable with that messaging and that they truly understand that part of it. I also think you've got some good points there and this comes not so much to the training, but this comfort zone is, is it a clean environment? Um, are we safe working together in that environment? Um, I think are things that we as employers must ensure and guarantee. Um, because those are expectations. I think the other thing that is important is a lot of people have um, considered leaving our industry to go elsewhere because of the you know, the wages and the problems we've had in terms of consistency of work and, and, you know, longevity, we need to come at this with, I won't say necessarily guarantees, but something that is more promising that we had. And we need to have that messaging. And I think it's something that you've got to go out and recruit with as well, too, and be prepared for that. And that's, uh, that's something that I think that uh, I don't know the exact answer to that, but it's beyond training. I mean, I think we can get people trained. We know how to do that really well, but it's really trying to stroke those people and say, we want you, you're smart. Um, we are going to do everything here to the best of our ability to ensure that we have longevity and you stay with us. I think we're still all at the mercy of, of the pandemic. We're still at the mercy of what's happening with the government um, and, and both in the U.S. And, and in Canada. Um, but those are all great positive questions that you've given us to think about. And I think they have to be incorporated into those expectations. And that's exactly what I'm saying about the customer, that you've got to be able to assure them that it's a safe environment. 
Um, so those are, I think, probably number one on both categories uh, to the employee and to the customer and say, we're safe. Yeah. And what uh, it made me just actually think of is with those employees that come back that stay with the one restaurant that they're the valued, they love the place, this is home, this is their family. It's asking them what they think and why they're coming back and what they believe would bring other people to come work because why do they feel safe? Why do they feel secure? Why is it good for them? Because they're the ones that have the answers to make it grow because they're coming back and they want to stay and they want to return. Absolutely. I mean, that's the first thing you're going to do for each either set of customers. What does the customer want? What do you want as an employee? What do you think? Um, this place is all about. Why do you like it? Why have you come? Why are you coming back? Those kinds of things. And the same thing you ask to the customer: What is it you like about us? Are we doing a good job? What's your favorite thing? We need to know all of that data. And yeah. those two things help us come together to deliver exactly that experience that both parties are looking for. Yeah, and, and treat it. You know. It, Maybe you want to tell everybody what it is uh, you do for a living because it's a perfect question to come from you. Um, but just on that, I think that, you know, when I'm talking about culture, that's a big part of the restaurant culture, that culture of safety and, you know, going through what is our plan because there's, you know, people are going to come in, they're not going to care. I mean, down here in the US, everybody is on top of each other to get in through the doors right now. It's, it's, it's funny and scary all at the same time. Um, but it's, it's a fair thing that you need to make sure you have that, that uh, those pieces for them so they can properly be feel safe themselves and let your guests know they're safe. So just quickly share what uh, your background is. Combination of things, but coming from this perspective of what this discussion entails, um, I am trained in psychological health and safety advisor throughout Canada to do those assessments in the workplace. I am a mediator. So for the conflict, but also I'm a facilitator for over 25 years in resiliency. So where I'm coming from is looking at that operational resiliency of helping all the staff that are returning, the management, identifying their strengths, where they're the leaders in that particular traits and pulling them into creating the new strategic plan, the contingency plans and how we're gonna go forward because you're gonna use it from a strength base but if you don't know how to identify who's what people's strengths are, how do you pull it out? So I, I do have an assessment tool that I help people identify, but this is where you use the resiliency traits, the strengths mm -hmm. of everybody, have that team meeting, leadership building, and you create from the past experiences and the learning everybody's gone through through COVID to create the new strategic planning contingency plans of how we're going to roll out for when we can open up again. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Trina. Mr. Lawler, if you'd like to unmute yourself. How are you, Trina? Um, very good points, and, and David also. Um, the thing is, the strategic, I think that the COVID return strategic plan, if you call it, that's what we got to sit back and take a look at. Um, where are we today? Um, so it, it needs an analysis and also very much depends on what you are, um, what I'm getting at. Uh, ownership structure. Are you a sole proprietorship? Are you a, a managed? Are you franchised? Et cetera. But the very first step, I think, in that strategic plan in terms of looking at the situ situation analysis is, in actual fact, sorry, we can hear something. Okay. The very first thing, <laughs> I thought that was David. Uh, no, <laughs> so, no. Um, I think the very first thing is to stop where are, what's your situation today? What did we learn out of COVID? It wasn't all bad. Um, if you look at, you know, we learned how to, in actual fact, uh, for restaurant tours who throw nickels around like their manhole covers, which we do, um, at the end of the day, what were the positives? One of the positives came out, we learned how to, in actual fact, engage our customers with takeout. Notwithstanding the fact we can talk about skip the dishes and all those lovely things, but we won't go there. But what I'm getting at is there's been very successful individuals that, in actual fact, have taken a takeout menu and not just basically come pick it up, have basically processed it that you can bring your meal at home and prepare it at home. So it's, it tastes just like it came out of the, uh, it just it has been just prepared. It's a whole bunch of things to sous vide, to, to exact that it can put together. So one of the things is that's tremendously profitable because it, uh, if you've done it right, notwithstanding the fact is that you've got all these uh, uh, third parties taking a piece of it. But 
What have we learned just in those aspects? So what have we learned? Where have our costs been? A very good analysis would be in actual fact to look at your business and specifically look at the costs. Uh, what, what today on the same basis of business you've got, what were the most profitable things and what could we potentially bring that forward? To Trina's point, I think what's very important is that in actual fact, before you, when you're getting close, before you start to reopen, obviously, is to do an employee opinion survey. So in other words, go out and meet the employees that in actual fact you had working for you. One, are they coming back? Uh, two, what would they like to see? To your point, Trina, what is it? Uh, what are the key things that they would like to see? And also start to, start to think about what type of things you could do in actual fact to incentivize and motivate them. You don't motivate people, you create an environment by which people are motivated. So first of all, is where is the employees? Like, where are they? And, and specifically, what are the key things that are angst? The second thing is your guests. Uh, the guests that's going back to the guest and asking them the same uh, questions. Because honestly, uh, as an old fart, I'm not too <laughs> crazy about walking into a restaurant um, <laughs> You know, even if everything's you know, we're open, we're ready, we're ready for business. Um, so what would your guests want to see? Uh, and that again is, uh, so you need a guest analysis. From all of that starts to create your, your, uh, your uh, create kind of a situation else that you're in. The third thing is, uh, one of the other things is procurement. Um, you know, one of the things I'm just involved with right now is uh, you've got these major companies that in actual fact are uh, solidifying spend. Um, you know, one of them was a vendor, of course, but that's been murdered Aramark. But I'm working actually with a major company at the moment specifically, and what they're looking at is consolidating more and more spend. Because the next thing you should definitely do a uh, test is on your, on your suppliers. Where are your suppliers at? Where's the landlord at? So, the, so from that strategic plan, you can also basically develop a marketing plan and from, um, from that marketing plan, you can basically have a business plan to go along with it. There's just some suggestions. Yeah, no, great, great suggestions. Thank you, sir. Uh, and that was some that, you know, kind of leads into uh, some of the stuff I wanted to get into in the next part. But, you know, definitely doing that assessment of, of where you are uh, is, is a critical piece because, you know, COVID forced a lot of innovation that was already kind of on its way, but maybe not as quickly as it would have been and really kind of pushed us in that direction. So, you know, knowing where you are, looking at what you did to get through, are those components of that that are gonna to continue to be a part of your business because they worked well, they made you money, they helped you survive and they're not just gonna disappear. So there are some great, uh, and I mean, there's a lot of different types of innovation. I mean, it can be simple things like, you know, maybe you need a scheduling system so that you don't have to spend so much time writing a schedule in the office. Maybe, you, you know, maintenance tracking, or maybe it's an ordering system, or, you know, I'm starting to see more and more down here. And, I, and I've talked about this before where they still write down your order. They go away to a terminal to punch it in. They bring you your stuff. And then at the end of it, they take your credit card, they walk away for, 45 minutes, go onto Amazon, buy themselves something, and then bring your card back. Not quite, but they're starting to finally bring in a technology where they can you can order at the table with them, you can pay at the table with them, and it's just increasing the speed, it's reducing steps for the servers. So these are the types of things, you know, have you added that? Is it something that's good for your business? Are you going to continue with it? You know, there's definitely a lot of things we need to look at to determine, you know, where are we going to get to? And, and how is that going to help you in the recruiting process? Because if you're finding some efficiencies, maybe you don't need as many staff as you had before. You can pay the ones you do have a little bit more, make them happier, and still hit the targets you're trying to look at, right? So uh, lots of great points out there. But I would love to hear, um, uh, you know, if anybody else has any questions or thoughts on that. Actually, Alnor, I just saw you, uh, um, you know, if you want to just kind of, I don't know if it was a question or if you just wanted to, I know you're working on a, on a new system to kind of help with, uh, with that. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different systems, you know, different marketing systems, uh, text marketing systems or, or different types of marketing systems to get the information of developing that plan. Um, 
there's not one piece that's going to get you everything. And I did go through, I don't know if I had a few people respond to the survey I sent out prior to the call, which asked four questions. And it was really, what are the, what's the first thing you're going to do to get your restaurant in open? 40% of the respondents went right to hire, which doesn't surprise me because that's the gut feeling. I'm, I'm opening up. I'm going to be busy. I need to have staff to service these guests. Right. Next was budgeting the sales, which seems to, you know, how do you hire if you don't know what your sales are going to be? Third was um, reviewing of the menu. And, and Fred, to your point, there's also, can you get the stuff to make those items on your menu? Is it available? I mean, there's lots of things that you can't get right now. And maybe you can short term, but you won't get them long term. Maybe they need to be a, a a limited feature or kind of a, you know, it's the weekends or once or twice a week until that's back in stock more permanently. And the number four uh, was reviewing any of the uh, changes that were made during the pandemic. So, you know, the gut feel for everybody in the, for the majority of people in the industry um, is to go directly to that hiring piece because we know we need people and it's such one of the biggest struggles. But I think if we miss these other pieces and don't focus on them, we could get ourselves in a real situation where we're going to either have too many or we're not going to have a, enough to handle the business properly. So um, any other thoughts on uh, on that? I know I've talked to a few of you that uh, about this and maybe you'd like to give some, uh, and I don't want to voluntold somebody, but uh, you know, any other thoughts on, on, on where the focus should be or what do you think the steps are that we should be taking is hiring should hiring be the number one step mike you're what are you doing ready to get opening uh, once we get the green light in ontario with your restaurant it's mike o'connor mr o'connor you think he's trying to unmute thank himself. you i'm just on just unmuting okay <laughs> hey, dude. hey mike um adam thank you again for uh getting this together yeah you bet. um it's it's challenging because obviously um, Toronto and uh, and Peel Mississauga um, uh, have been under lockdown for a lot longer than any other place. Um, I, I think maybe in the world. I mean, I could be mistaken, but certainly Canada and the U.S. So there are there are some challenges. Our our last day of operation was March 16th last year. Uh, it didn't make financial sense for us to stay open because the hotel was going under construction. Uh, and that timeline, they're still under construction and we're attached to the hotel, the Sheridan Center in downtown Toronto. And a lot of our takeout and, and uh, catering part of our business was the offices, which are empty, right? So... If we were a smaller place with a smaller kitchen, we would have stayed open. Uh, but we're a 10,000 square foot place with three individual brands in, in one place. So it didn't make sense for us to uh, reopen. We're looking at opening in the fall. Um, and uh, to your point, uh, Darren uh, and, uh, and David, staffing is gonna be the key. Um, because with that length of time, we do have a, an operation on Center Island, and we were, we were able to get some of our staff over there summer, last summer, and, and hopefully this summer, uh, the way things are looking with the infection rate, I'm knocking on wood here right now. Um, so we'll be able to get some of them back there, but staffing's key. Um, there's no question about it. Um, we have we don't have a definitive opening date yet. So we aren't reaching out to our staff yet because it's not fair to them to, to figure out what's going on. And there's a pause in the construction of the hotel because of COVID, because it's considered non-essential construction. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's really difficult, but that's, you know, we had a great team of 66 staff members that, and our sales were, we did the best year, we had the best year we ever had in, in, uh, in 2019. The staff made a lot of money. Uh, we did very well uh, as a management team. And uh, 
So we're looking to get back into that. But how many of our team members have decided to move out of the hospitality industry and, and, and go into other things is, is key. Um, I've been staying in touch and doing references for people to be able to get other positions, but, and they're not positions in the restaurant business because that, where do you go? You're running lean and, and, and all you're doing is, is takeout and delivery. Um, you don't need servers. Generally it's a manager, a couple of kitchen people. Um, and, and then obviously when the, when the patio is open, which we hope is sooner than June 14th, and we've heard that, that that may happen, then you can bring some more of your staff back. But it's, it, it's challenging. And we're not the only place that's going through this. If we're right in downtown Toronto, uh, if you're in the suburbs, they're going through it as well. Um, but we, it, just trying to figure out who you can get back and, um, and, and, and be able to give them the confidence. I just want to make one other small point. Further to David's comment initially, um, when restaurants reopened for inside dining, um, I was very particular about the places that I went to, okay? And I went to a few more places than, than most. I like dining out. That's part of who I, who I am. And, and, and when I went out, um, I was very aware of what's going on, whether they were doing the contact tracing, whether they were using the hand sanitizer, whether they were got the masks on, whether, whether the bartender and the food runner, and when you're clearing plates, are you, are you, are you cleaning and sanitizing your hands before you, before you're delivering food to the table and all those things. Now, and people were exactly, you know, I know a little bit more about it because this is the business I've grown up in, but other people are looking at that as well. And they're looking to see how you are doing and, and the protocols that you do to make sure that they feel safe. Um, and, um, and I only go to places, <laughs> I've been to a couple of places, but have them in back where they haven't done the things that, that, that they need to do to give people that confidence give your guests the confidence and the staff the confidence that they're, they're in a safe environment um, uh, to dine in and work in. Thanks, Darren. That's a good point, Mike. That's, right. That's another expectation that we've had to now add on to just the social dining out experience or wherever we're going for is, are we safe? Um, you know, Trina talked about that, but, you know, what is the protocol? And, I, and when Darren and I chatted earlier, I said, we've got to be really careful to manage that customer experience. I mean, they're coming back. It's bent up demand. They're expecting a lot of great things, including being safe. But even to the extent of, of getting them in and not being able to serve them in the appropriate time frame, And that's going to come down to staffing and the ability to have the right staff and be able to execute that. So I think another thing we've got to talk about is how do you communicate to the customer kind of like, we're going to give you great service. You're going to be patient and you, we might not be able to open fully. We're going to have to control the crowd and how many we can serve because we want to execute it hundred percent. We don't want to fill the restaurant and have, you know, a servers trying to do an extra five tables that they can't handle. And we've seen those busy nights. We've had somebody call in sick, the disaster of that. So I think we need to have messaging in place as well to talk about, you know, we're doing all the right things, we're ready to serve you, but it will be controlled. And, uh, you know, so that we manage that process because I, I'm afraid if we get open and you get too many people at the door, you're gonna disappoint them and they might not come back. Yeah, no, and, and some good points there. And, and there's a couple of things there that really kind of comes down to that being having that as part of the training plan. And I know Trina, you just mentioned that one of the things that made you feel more comfortable was that the servers were explaining the stuff they were doing to to keep you safe in the restaurant. So you know that's probably something that should be part of your marketing plan when you're welcoming your guests back and, and trying to bring them back. Um, but also needs to be a part of that training plan that your, your team that maybe hasn't been there through all this that you're bringing on new or bringing back that they understand the processes. I mean, here's hoping that they all understand what proper hand washing is. I know I have seen that 
uh, it doesn't always work that way. Um, uh, I'm sure we've all seen a hundred things that we could share of, of, you know, people doing things in restaurants that you may do that at home, but you can't do that when you're in a restaurant. Um, so yeah, that's definitely uh, some parts of that. Al Nori, if, if uh, you had a, a question you wanted to ask, um, if you wanted to uh, unmute yourself and, and share if you're, uh, you're there. There you are. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I actually wanted to ask a question where how to pass the barrier of the restaurant owners and managers saying no. Uh, there is technology out there, as Darren was mentioning, as, as you know, everybody's mentioned so far, and passing that barrier is very difficult. I've got certain different technologies or uh, methods of helping them market um, their, either their menus or even um, using uh, text messaging for payment systems and things like that. And currently I'm working on another um, sort of platform for the restauranters as well as the customers but all i've been coming across here in uh, calgary is no 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 or they don't return phone calls how do you pass that because we know that uh from the discussions that we're having right now as well as previous ones and the ones that i've had with uh with uh, darren and uh, so on um restauranters need it they need the help and it's not going to go away. Whether COVID it's opened up, it's going to be a rush to get to the restaurants. And then what happens? It's just going to be like that pop bottle that you know you shake it up and it fizzes out. And then after a while, there's nothing left. So how what do we do to uh, get past that? Any suggestions? Yeah, and, and you know on that, Eleanor, thank you for that. You know that's one of the reasons why I created this list because I, those of us who have grown up in this business or spent a lot of time working in this business. We know how important the gut feel is. I've been in this business a long time. My gut tells me I should be to be doing X. I should be doing Y. I should be doing Z, right? Uh, and it, it's tough to get beyond that because I know my business. I know my people. Here's what I'm going to do. But I think COVID has shown us that what you did in the past isn't always going to work in the future. You need to be open to, to new change. So, you know, there's going to be those who I think are open to it. And we've seen it in a lot of markets. I mean, the main reason I started great minds is because we kept hearing all the negative things that were going on out there. We weren't sharing any of the positives. And I was seeing restaurants that were stepping up and being innovative. Uh, I know that the word that everybody uses and hates to hear is the word pivot. I hear pivot and I just picture Ross, Ross and a coach going up the stairs. Um, but that's what we needed to do, right? We needed to find ways to adapt. We needed to, it was really, if you think about it, it's almost um, the evolution in the restaurant. You know, it's that next stage of evolution for the restaurant business. Here's where we were, here's what happened to us. And we needed to quickly evolve to get through it. And those that did a good job of being innovative and evolving are the ones that are in a better shape right now and are going to be probably in better shape to open when that time comes. And it's already here. And I mean, a lot of markets, it's here, especially in the U.S. You know, Alberta, they're supposed to be, Stampede's going to happen this year. Um, I've been told by some of my contacts out there that June 15th restrictions gone in Alberta. It's basically, you know, fully restricted to, holy crap, we're completely open, right? It's just a lot of time to prepare. So if your market isn't quite there, that's why I'm suggesting, and I know, Mike, just you're, you're talking about the fall when you're reopening. We need to start, we needed to be doing this a while ago, but we need to really look at it and decide, you know, what do we need to do? And it, it's not that, you know, these 10 steps that I have in this list, you need to spend 10 weeks on them, but you really need to, to, to start looking at these things to make sure you're ready properly to open those doors at the capacity you need to. Doug? Yeah, so uh, just listening in and, and thinking about how do you bring back staff who I'm quite certain, I know for me anyway, that I'm ju we're just longing for normalcy. We're longing to get back to, uh, you know, just serving a, a nice dinner or a nice meal to somebody. And so I think from management and ownership standpoint, the onus comes back to us is how can we circumvent any of those direct 
you know, quote unquote, COVID related things that the servers will have to go up against. So for them to explain why they're having to do something, for them to explain why there's only so many seats or whatever. And so as you touched on just a little bit ago, I think it's internal marketing. I think that if we can, as restaurateurs, as operators, um, I guess kind of get those questions out of the way for our, our customers so that our staff don't have to be bombarded with the why, do, why is this, why is that, why can't I have this, why can't I have this other person sitting next to me, or whatever the, the re restrictions are. But if with appropriate signage or with a what to expect pamphlet as they're coming in, or um, just things like that, I think anything that we can do as operators and as restaurateurs to kind of lessen that blow, because uh, you know, they just want to get back to serving. They want to be able to uh, offer them a, a great experience. So I, I think yeah. it may not be technology. It may not be uh, other systems. I mean, I, I'm a proponent of technology. I mean, that's what I do. But uh, it may just be some simple steps that we can take, whether it's a signage in the, in the right spot, whether it's, uh, like I said, just, you know, Whatever it is, yeah. as the customer comes in, just to, to kind of just anything that you can do to alleviate the stress of that situation on our servers and on our staff is yeah. uh, is huge. Yeah, no good points, Doug. You know, and just as you're talking, I mean, we've all seen, yeah, you can't see it, yeah. the QR codes, right? You should be doing maybe it's the stuff at the entry and some other things. So it's a good point, Doug, because the less that you're uh, team has to explain what you're doing to the guests, the faster the guest experience is going to be, and they can focus on that as opposed to talking about what you're doing. But, you know, using those QR codes, like many are in the restaurant that I was at yesterday, uh, one close to my place that uh, we go to, it was Memorial Day, we got to sat, I, I, I turned my office uh made it the, the patio there and sat there by the lake, had a drink and, and did work from there, but it was packed, but they've really gone forward and they're using that QR code. They, they put this thing, it's a, it's a nice hard, so it's easy to clean for them, but maybe those QR codes are a way to get that information. Instead of going straight to the menu, maybe the QR code starts off with something that says, you know, your safety is our concern and here's what we're doing to make sure that you're here in a safe welcome uh environment so i mean coming back again to technology that there's a lot of things that it can do to help us save time and focus on the guest instead of some of that other stuff right so some good points here thank you doug so I, I know we've got some operators on here. I'd love to hear a little bit more, but what are some of the things that you've utilized during COVID that you're going to continue to use? What are some of the biggest innovations or the best things? And maybe it's it's not necessarily an operator, but uh, from a guest perspective as well, what are some of the things that you've seen that you feel should continue and need to continue? Um, you know, one of the big things that uh, that really took off during COVID was ghost kitchens. And we've seen a lot of growth in that aspect. Um, I know we had a, a call, a, a three calls ago, we had George Cotis from Ghost Kitchen Brands. And you've probably all seen on LinkedIn all the, the innovation and growth that they're doing, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, but what are some of the things that you've seen that are, need to stick around? Okay. Is it drive-through windows on full service restaurants? We've seen a bunch of that. Sam, were you wanting to, uh, to share something? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for having me on and, and having Thanks this. Thanks, Reiner. It's great. I'm in uh, the opposite, the other Ontario, Ontario too, Ontario, California. Ontario, California. Nice. And uh, and you know, I've been really fortunate and blessed, and um, even throughout this pandemic, our business has grown, um, and nice. a huge percent of it has been, you know, third party delivery. Um, it's changed how we've designed restaurants. It's changed how we are looking at restaurants. I'm in the quick service industry. Um, I've been in the restaurant industry for 26 years, all quick service. And we have definitely learned a lot. We've uh, learned, you know, different technology, ordering through phone. I'm, I'm here out of Starbucks. And, uh, you know, we, we notice, and as a consumer, I notice how my frequency has increased 
by having you know the opportunity to order through an app um our drive-throughs have never been better right um so you know definitely drive-through is is just a beauty trying to um you know we've we've definitely have, have changed the way that we manage a drive-through how we staff a drive-through um if you're going to you know some of our competitors out here you know there's a whole team that's outside of the building that where prior was you had a you had a speaker and a drive couple drive through windows and that was your drive through team um so you know it's definitely uh helped us uh in changing our the way that we uh take care of our customer um you know third party delivery for us i i believe is here to stay uh maybe not at the percentage that it, it was through the pandemic um, but uh, it's definitely something we, we've had to change designs. We've had to change how we manage that, how many managers per shift to be able to do that. Um, we looked at our operations uh, as a three, you know, we're managing three restaurants. We're managing the dine-in business takeout. We're managing the third party and we're managing those drive through lines. So, um, you know, it's definitely has been a learning year for all of us, um, but also, you know, we've, we've gone better because of it. Um, as far as staffing goes, staffing in California, it is, you know, very, very challenging. Um, so we've had to, you know, to get the very best, we've had to make a very uh, important change and, and one that as an operator, gosh, I was operator for years, has just been amazing, has, has been a, a game changer. Um, and we're very competitive with pay, but we've gone a four day work week, which is like, you know, some people probably fell down when I said that right now, you know, but the four day work week, we are attracting individuals that are absolute best, right? So we're getting these operators that are going like, before I even talk about dollar amount, I mean, you could just see that four day work week four day work week is something that is just outstanding. Um, we put this together, we, we made out a schedule for a whole month, uh, you know, advantages, disadvantages, how, how we're gonna work this out. What does that mean as, as total in, uh, total managers uh, per restaurant? And um, we're, we're getting people that you would never think that would leave great corporations. Uh, I'm a California guy. You know, in and out is like the holy, you know, the, the best of the best in California. People love it. Uh, I was prior 14 years at In and Out Burger, so I absolutely love it still. And um, we're getting quality, fantastic operators because they, they want a better work life balance. So, um, and trust me, uh, you know, we're very, very fortunate with the bottom lines that we're able to you know, that we're performing at a level that's just amazing. And uh, our team is rejuvenated. Um, you know, people want to know more about us. Uh, and we have folks that are with other concepts right now that can't wait for us to open up another restaurant so they can come on board. It, it's, a, it's a different mentality. I know a lot of folks would say, absolutely not. You're, you're insane, Sam. Keep, uh, keep drinking and smoking what you guys do in California. It doesn't work. But I can tell you, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and uh, I've never had better operators. That's great. You know what? And that's, we don't talk a lot about that. And, I, you know, I've heard some murmurs around, but the work-life balance is definitely something that because of what's been going on, people have a better appreciation of what that means to them. And they're going to be more demanding for it going forward. So uh, I, I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, just in your your business. So I mean, the QSR is a little bit different than obviously, you know, the sit down and, and I spent a lot of years in QSR as well. What are the things that you're focusing on right now? Because, you know, when we get to that point, and I'm not sure where California is, but when you get to that point where it's, open the doors hundred percent, you know, what are, is, is the, rec the hiring, the thing that you're focusing on, or are there other things that you're looking at first to make sure that you've got the right, the right bodies? Where are you guys starting off? 
um, we did a lot of strategic planning, you know, how are we gonna attract uh, those ACEs? Um, you know, what are we gonna do to retain those individuals? What, what have other fantastic companies done to, you know, to retain folks like, you know, the retention at in and out is just absolutely amazing. Um, what is Raising Cane's doing out there? Another great brand that I had the privilege to work with. Um, and, you know, so they're really looking at what great brands are doing and how we can add to that um, as far as uh, providing a better um, quality of life, work out, life balance, whatever it is that, you know, you want to refer to it. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that, but um, it is very, very tough, very challenging right now um, to get your restaurant staffed up. Um, but that has been a, a big one for us is uh, really thinking about staffing, really um, trying to, uh, you know, one of the things that going back to the four day work week that I want to talk about is um, our operators are our best recruiters because uh, it, we're in the restaurant industry. Our best friends are in the restaurant industry. Our, you know, everybody, we're all connected. And uh, when they're out and about or they're working, you know, with us now and they, they talk about the, the four day work week, you know, their friends are calling us up and going, hey, when's the next one open up and, and what do I have to do? Um, I'll come in and as, as an assistant manager and work myself up because I want that next spot as a general manager because I, I, I want, you know, what Ray's talking about when we go out to dinner with them. Right. So, um, you know we didn't really think that that was part of the strategic plan where our operators would be our, our best recruiters. Right. Um, but it, it's turned out that way. Right. So, um, you know, th that's what, what we've been doing as a customer. Uh, this Saturday, I went out to have lunch uh, with my wife and uh, walked in the order taker uh, did not have a face mask. And uh, my wife, you know, came back outside to the patio area and it was like she had seen a ghost, you know, so uh, we weren't quite ready for that uh, as a consumer. And uh, and neither was I and we're fully vaccinated and, and so forth. But uh, maybe the peace of mind isn't quite there yet where I'm where where I'm at. Um, so it, it made me realize uh, personally, as a consumer, I'm not quite there yet, even though we're both fully vaccinated, can't wait to take off the mask. Um, as a consumer, there's still that peace of mind is just so odd um, that I felt a little bit more comfortable when somebody had a face mask on. You know, so uh, it was very interesting. It was very, very interesting. Um, but the place was packed. You know, restaurant was packed. Like, people couldn't wait to get out. So yeah. hopefully that answers your question and also give you a little bit no. of feedback of how it is here that's, in California. Yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's a good point, too, that. And I've had operators here ask me, you know, we don't need to, if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to have, wear a mask in Minnesota. And, you know, a lot of places are pulling down their mask mandates because they're not going to police it. And I've had operators ask me, well, what about my team? What should I do? And I, you know, I kind of said, you're going to have that mix of people who are comfortable with them not wearing it and who are not comfortable with them not having a mask on. So you suggested, why don't you follow the governor's guideline of once we hit that 70% or this date, then take it off, right? Just so, because the person who doesn't want to wear a mask, who's either vaccinated or is pretending they're vaccinated, they're not going to care if your, your team is wearing a mask. The person who does care is going to appreciate it. So you basically cover your bases that way. So it's not going to hurt you to have your team wearing it. I think you'd have a good conversation with them and kind of explain that to them. They've been wearing it for this long. In a lot of cases, it might be two more weeks. They know you're going to have kind of a, a deadline to it. I think they'd be understanding and it's if it's going to positively impact their tips and their bottom line they're going to be happy to do it i think as well so uh guys we've got five minutes left uh is there anybody else who would like to uh, to share anything or uh, uh bring up a point you know i'd do we in, in my opinion we really you know we need to look at all these things there's been some great ideas and things that have been shared tonight uh and i know you know we, we 
cut back a lot to uh, the hiring piece of it, but you need to know that other stuff. You need to understand uh, those different pieces. So if you're wanting the checklist, I know we just went through it quickly at the beginning. I can make it available to you. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, the email address in the uh, the chat. Um, so feel free to send me uh, an email and I'll be more than happy to share it with you. Um, but the best thing that you can do for your business right now as we're getting closer to that is start planning, take a good look at where you are, what you've learned and where you think you're going to be. Because if you just go on that gut feel uh, and say, well, I, I need to hire all these people, you're probably going to be challenged and not, uh, and, a little behind the uh, the eight ball. So, um, David, thank you very much for participating tonight. I really appreciate You're it welcome, and, and your insight. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's Mr. Lawler. It was really really nice to see you. It's been a while. I appreciate you being here. Everybody who joined the call for the new ones that that joined this evening, thank you so much. Our next call is going to be the first Tuesday of July, which I believe is July the sixth. Uh, working on a couple of different topics, but we might actually get into the franchising topic this time because I know we're starting to see more and more of that happening. Uh, so uh, I will be sharing out some information on that. If you do have any topics or things you'd like us to focus on, please also email us at greatmindsessions at gmail.com. Uh, or if you want to be a panelist, we'd be more than happy to bring you on. Uh, thank you to everybody who shared tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if there's, if there's nothing else that anybody uh, has to share or wants to bring up, I'll let, uh, we'll call it quits. So I'll just one final ask, is there anything else that anybody would like to share? Nope. Thanks, Thanks, great call. All right, guys. Thank you so Bye. much. Enjoy your evening. Take okay. care, everybody. Hey, guys. Bye. Cheers. Yeah.